Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Crossroads Church. Man, you guys are looking so beautiful today. Wouldn't that worship was just amazing? Let's just go home. Let's go home right now. For those of you who don't know, my name is Marcus, and I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads Church. Uh, Before we get started, I was down in Round Rock doing a... um, a wedding yesterday, and I met three little ladies. One was a 91-year-old, beautiful, beautiful grandmother, and uh, they are all, they was like, man, we feel like we already know you. It's like, who are you? <laughs> and it's like, we're from Arkansas. We see you guys every single Sunday. So for those of you in Arkansas, God bless you. Welcome to Crossroads Church. And also for all of you who are listening on KWD, we appreciate you coming out and worshiping with us. Just get over your fears and get your tail over here live. <laughs> Okay, you're only just a few minutes away. So this morning, we are going to continue our series with identity that Pastor Joel began, which be praying for him. He is on his, he was in Switzerland and is on his way back. So he'll be doing a series called Tired in next month. <laughs> That's what I said too, but you know how he is. It's a great one. Um, little Johnny asked, what? <laughs> he asked his dad, he goes, dad, what's the difference between potentially and realistically, dad thinks about it for a minute, and he goes, here's what I want you to do. Go ask your mom, your sister, and your brother if they would go out and date Brad Pitt. Four million dollars. Kim. <laughs> Single woman right here. So they go, and mom, would you go and date Brad Pitt for a million dollars? He goes, heck yeah, I'll go date him. He goes, uh, I'll take all that money and you know, get you a great education for him. And the little sister said the same thing. He goes, man, I, not, not about education. He goes, I'd spend it. You know how much a million dollars is? And the little brother also, he goes, man, I would date. I'll put a dress on. I was like, yeah, I'll put a dress on too. <laughs> so he comes back. He goes, son, did you figure out the difference between potentially and realistically? And uh, little Johnny said, he goes, yep, potentially we're sitting on $3 million. <laughs> but realistically, we're living with two hookers and a guy who has identity crisis. <laughs> We're talking about identity this morning, and uh, I want to begin this with a question. I want to end this with the same question, and the question goes something like this. Who's defining you? Who's defining you? I think whoever, here's the reason why, because whoever or whatever you allow to define you, that becomes your master. So true, and if you're walking in love, love never allows anything to master itself. But who's defining you? I think the philosophy of this world is trying to uh, define who you are. And if you're not careful, you'll buy into this. And I'll call it a false self of identity, a false sense of identity of who you actually are. There's a framework that's being developed. And it's subtle, but it just, it's trying to determine what your value is. How? One of the primary ways I've seen in my own life and in people that we work with and just talk to and whatever, is to this thing called comparison. It's comparing. When you're comparing individuals, you know, ladies, well, all of us, we compare ourselves among ourselves. And the scripture says that that's not wise. Comparing always leads to complaining. Comparing always leads to criticizing either others or yourself. So this morning, I want to begin with um, a guy by the name of Levi, who was a tax collector in scripture. Now, Levi is our guitar player here, and he is not a tax collector. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, don't, I can't even go there, because Levi's a great brother. But um, Matthew, I mean, Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter, and uh, if you're taking notes, all the notes are in your app. And listen, I've got 91 slides this morning. I broke my record, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> I don't know if I'll get to them. I might just get to three or four, because it's already 941. But let's start right here in, Ma- in Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter, and we'll begin with this story here. Do you mind if I pray? This is a church, right? Lord, bless our time. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for open ears to hear what your Spirit wants to say. So we just declare you, Lord, over this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Luke five twenty seven says, After these things, he went out, and he saw a tax collector, Jesus. This is right after the situation when, you remember the four guys that came and brought a friend, and they lowered him on the roof, and he got healed and whatever? Well, right after that, 
um, after those things, he saw a tax collector named Levi. Levi, by the way, mean, means joined together. Sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he leaves everything. He leaves it all and raises, rose up and followed him. And Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. So that's kind of what you do. You know, if somebody, you know, you follow someone, he leaves his, um, his type of lifestyle. And he invites those friends who were probably other colleagues, other tax collectors, and others. And there were a great number of tax collectors there and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees, they're always around somehow, <laughs> complaining against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Hmm. hmm. Jesus answered and said to him, number one, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. He's connecting tax collectors, others, with people who are falling short, right? Because I've called people, um, not the righteous people, but I've called them to a place of repentance. That word repentance, is interesting that Jeremiah said that here this morning with the word repentance. That's where we get the Greek word right here, metanoio, metanoeo, and it means basically, fundamentally, it means to change your mind, to change your mind about something. Isn't that interesting? Repentance is always this real religious word that's like, you got to repent, and you're like all scared and stuff. But really, all he's trying to do is to get you to change your way of thinking. That's it. That's it, right. That simple. He wants to get you to change your way of thinking, to change your mind, so that it will impact how you change your lifestyle. That's good. Yeah. And it is a 180. It is a military term. If you're going this way, you're going to change your mind. If you are, anybody ever do skydiving? If you're skydiving, you know, you prepare, you go and do all the ripcord, you go through all this process, you prepare how you're supposed to land, and then you're all the way up in that airplane. And when they open that door, you're 7,000 feet down, and you look, some people change their mind, <laughs> right? They change their mind, and they don't go about what they thought they were supposed to do. Have a little picture there. So that's really what repentance is. It's, it's that simple. And I just lost all my notes, and here they are. And so, um, repentance is changing in how I think that leads to a change in how I live. And that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to get us to change our mind that leads us to change how we live. And so in the story, it goes on, and then they begin to question Jesus about fasting. And he goes on right here, and he says, it's basically a comparison trap. And they said to him, why do your disciples of John fast? often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make the friends of a bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. I love how he, how he does that. Isn't that good? Yeah. Obviously, the answer is no. No, I can't make him do that. Why? Because usually fasting um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, several reasons why they fast, but primarily fasting, the reason why they did it is because they wanted some guidance. They wanted some kind of direction. They wanted to figure out, uh, you know, Moses fasted when he was getting delivered the Ten Commandments. Um, David was fasting on behalf of the son, hoping that he would, you know, be alive. So usually when you're fasting, you're, you're getting some direction from God. And what Jesus is saying right here, he goes, listen, while the bridegroom, which is speaking of himself, he goes, why would I have people fast if they're asking for guidance? I am their guide. I am their help. I am their strength right now. They don't need to fast at this time. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so he said to them, can, I, can you make friends of the bridegroom? Well, bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them. The days will come when he'll be taken away. Then they're going to fast. But the obvious answer is this. It doesn't makes sense for them to fast at this time. Why? Because this is not a time for fasting. This is a time to celebrate. This is a time to have communion. This is a, a time to connect, to join together, to, to break bread together, and to bond together. Then he begins to speak a parable. And this is where a lot of people interpret these parables in a crazy, in a crazy ways. They talk about the law and grace. They talk about all these things. But I'm going to try to simplify this to you. 
I'm going to make what something, what something that's probably difficult to many real simple to this little uh, Seguin church with this little Mexican pastor. Okay? He gives them three parables. And it goes something like this. Then he spoke a parable to them and says, no one pizza put pizza. <laughs> Man, I'm hungry. <laughs> no one puts a piece from the new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also, a piece that was taken out of the new doesn't match the old. Right? So a lot of folks get into all this deep theology. And I get that. And we can go there if we want to next week. <laughs> but basically, he's saying, listen, it doesn't make sense. If you have an outfit or an old jeans that you love and you've already put them in the washer, they already have the shrink factor already taken care of, right? And then you make a hole in them. We used to, we used to patch holes. Now you buy them with holes. <laughs> um, but he says it's not, it's not practical. It doesn't make any sense to take a new piece of garment because it's still going to have a shrink factor in it. And you put it on something that's already been shrunk if you put it on there and sew it, well, it's going to expand. It's going to, bust, it's going to mess everything up. And the point is, it doesn't make sense to do that. Just like it doesn't make sense to fast while the bridegroom's right here. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> then he goes on. He says, no one puts new wine in old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. New wine has to be put in new wineskins, and both are preserved. Same idea. It doesn't make sense. Why? Because it, the old wine, you know, when, whenever the flask or whatever you put that in, that thing also has an, exp, you know, it, when it ferments, it expands. But when you already have the, the wineskin that's already expanded, then you put new wine in it, it wants to expand because it's going, wanting to ferment. And he goes, it's not, it doesn't make sense to do that because then it's going to burst and then you won't have anything, old, new, or wineskin. Everything will bust. So the point again is, it doesn't... Come on, let's do it again. It doesn't what? Yes, it doesn't make sense. And then the last one, he says, And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. Amen, Amen Natalie. <laughs> How many guys know that new wine... Old wine is better than new wine. New wine, the tannins, not that I'm a pro, a pro at this, but I live with one. Um, <laughs> the tannins, that acid that's in there, and in the beginning, new wine, it, has, it gives off this bitter kind of a taste. But the older it sets, it's already gone through its process, and it has this beautiful aroma and flavor, and it's good for you one glass a day for your stomach. That's what Paul said. That's what Paul says, right? As a matter of fact, never mind. <laughs> we were doing that wedding yesterday, and we were doing communion. And the wife, the, the bride didn't know that I was going to serve communion, but um, the, the groom did because I spoke to him. He goes, hey, do you want to do, you want to do communion? He's a military, he's a Marine. He goes, yes, sir. He goes, I want to do communion. It's like, okay, you got it. So when the bride heard about it, he was like, oh, I didn't know about that. He goes, here's my only um, uh, request. Yes, thank you, baby. He goes, I don't want your grape juice. Let's throw a shot in there. I'm like, okay, let's throw a shot in there. <laughs> Anyways, just thought about that. It doesn't make sense, he said, having drunk the old wine, immediately desires now. He says the old is better. It doesn't make sense. New wine is, I mean, old wine is better than new wine. And in, in this story, there's really just a comparison trap that the enemy through the Pharisees and the Sadducees, well, these scribes and folks are trying to get him to buy into. I used to have an instructor years ago, and it, it, it branded a statement in my, in my heart. I really didn't know what it meant then, but I know what it means now even stronger. But he says, don't ever complain, don't ever criticize, and don't ever compare. He goes, don't compare, don't complain, don't criticize. And I realized that the front end of it, comparing, leads to the rest of it. And it's not good for any of us. And the enemy has tactics. The enemy is always trying to distract you. He's trying to place an identity upon you that doesn't even matter, that's real artificial, that's superficial, that's real shallow, to get you to buy into this uh, identity that is actually false, it's a false self. It's what I call a false self. A false self, you have a true self, and you have a false self. Do you know that? 
Most of us live out of a false self a lot of times. Our true self is what you see when a little young child is just, it's like we were talking about yesterday, is that little kids were giving us prayer requests in their home. And man, they don't know because my mommy and daddy are always fighting. Or anyways, it's just, you know, they're just, they're just living out of their true self, out of that sense of innocence, out of that sense of love. As we get older, you know, we buy into these set of agreements. Uh, we buy into a mindset. We buy into the set of agreements. And all of us go through this. There's not one of us here that's exempt. It might come from our parents. It might come from family. It might come from school. It might come from individuals, coaches, or teachers in your school. It could come from friends. Later on, it could come from your spouse. It could come from culture. It could come from religion. You need to do this. You need to weigh this much. Like, I don't know who put those standards on. You're five foot eight. You get to be at 180 pounds. Like, <laughs> I love me. Jesus loves me. You might not love me. My wife loves my long house. Amen. Amen. But a lot of times we, we buy into this thing. That's the bait that he uses. The, uh, the, it's a paradigm to compare. Does that make sense? False self is also called a small self. And it could be based upon your appearance. It could be based upon how much money you make. It could be based upon your education, what kind of job you have. All these things, if you're not careful, you'll buy into it. And then you'll begin to compare and criticize and complain because you're not at this certain expectation of either yourself or others. And you'll never learn how to live out of the true joy of how God thinks about you. Does that make sense? Okay, that makes sense, right? But we buy into this all the time. It's a false self. Psychologist Bill Plotton says it's called a survival dance. The survival dance compared to a sacred dance. The sacred dance is learning how to live out of the identity that you get from God's word and what Jesus says about you and what God's word says about you. It's a sacred place. It's a beautiful place. We don't have to live out of that survival dance. We learn how to just waltz with Jesus. I call it living out of the tree of life and living or living out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have you ever heard that concept? Good, I haven't either. But here it is. We live out of one of those trees. You know, any of those trees in the beginning, you, you, you eat the fruit thereof, you digest it, and it becomes a part of you. If you live out of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, you're always, you're all, you have this standard, what's good, what's evil, what's right, what's wrong. You're working in, among individuals, you're connecting with folks like, that's wrong, that's right. And you're measuring people based upon the measurement that you can't even uphold yourself. That's living out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Out of the tree of life, it's just based upon truth and love and joy and out of a good place in God. Oh, man, they're probably struggling through some stuff. But, man, God loves them. He cares about them. He's running after them. He's, you know, he wants them to grow stronger and better rather than, man, shame on you. Make sense? Yeah. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Tree of, you can read your Bible out of one of those trees. When you read your Bible, you know, it's dry, but the pastor said you better read your Bible. So you begin to read your Bible based upon duty, and then you look at scriptures, and you look for scriptures as ammunition to use against your spouse. You need to be doing this. You ever seen and heard Christians that are, they, they, I mean, they know the Bible, but they use it as a sword and, and they're just constantly bombastic in you, right? Bombastic. What is, I don't even know what that means. They're kind of, you know, just taking a, a sword and just doing that. Well, you need to do this. You need to stop doing that. Here's what the Bible says. Shut up. Really? Let God work in me. Let me just allow me to, to work and process. Yeah, I know the Holy Spirit's already convicted me. I don't need you to also double convict me. All right? Be a friend, man. Encourage me. Build me up. Strengthen me. Walk out of the tree of life rather than the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or you can read your Bible out of the tree of life. And the Holy Spirit, he's pulling on your heartstrings, and he's persuading you, and he's 
encouraging you, and he's motivating you, and he's empowering you, and he's speaking creative ideas, and there's inspiration, and there's wisdom, and there's script writing, and there's beautiful concepts on how you can communicate God's word. It's just you're reading it out of the tree of life. We all have this bias. We all have these tendencies. And it's necessary to begin there, but what if you continue to go there and what you're doing is actually false? What if you buy in? Because you'll see this often in your life as well. If you have this false sense of identity, then you spend the rest of your life protecting it. You spend the rest of your life promoting it. And it becomes a measuring stick to judge people, to compare and to criticize and to complain. Your false self is your container. It's your wineskin. And if it's old, nothing new that God wants to do in your life can come inside of it. Man, this is a great Presbyterian church. (laughs) Seriously. Bottom line, it doesn't make sense to use your old sinful nature to be transformed. It's impossible. It's impossible to use this old nature, the sinful nature, those sinful habits, those sinful thinking, that, that mindset. It's impossible to be transformed if that's how you operate. You can't change that old container. Natural wisdom doesn't have the power to. Let me explain it this way. First Corinthians, the second chapter. It says this. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness to them. It doesn't make sense to them. And nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Look at how the Passion Translation translates this. It says, someone living uh, on an entirely human level rejects the revelations of God's Spirit. For they make no sense to him. But he can't understand them, the revelations of the Spirit, because they are only discovered by the illumination of the Spirit. Notice what 1 Corinthians 1 says. It says, the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, It has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed to them to us through his spirit. You and I who've been born again, we have his spirit on the inside of us. And the one thing that the the, the desire of the Holy Spirit is to, to get you to understand your inheritance that you have in Christ Jesus. Now we have received, not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That's the supernatural uh, idea of being born again. You are born of the spirit of God. A new nature has been given on the inside of you. When you said yes to Jesus, all things have passed away. All things have become new, but it started here on the inside. God needs to make you new. He gives you a new nature. That new nature has a new identity. Then he fills you with his spirit. He fills you with truth. He fills you with wisdom. His leading doesn't condemn. His leading doesn't compare. His leading doesn't criticize or complain. No, it celebrates life. It connects. It has fellowship. It breaks bread. It rejoices. It receives wisdom from above. Here's what the scripture says. And let me just give you kind of a picture of an illustration. Uh, Here's your new identity. The old you has been crucified with Christ. It says, your old nature, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified. This old nature has been crucified. When he was crucified, here's a reality. You were crucified with him. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Amen? You've been crucified with Christ. And so if you just picture your old self, you know, remember we had the cross over there. It's like, that's your old self, Danny. I'm dead. Not only were you crucified with him, the scripture says that you died with him too. It goes on to say in Colossians 3, 3, your old life, this sinful nature, this comparing nature, this idea, this is where it all comes from. It goes, that nature has died with Christ, your old life. And notice what it says in verse 3. It says, and your new life is now hidden with Christ in God. This old life has died. Now you have a new life. 
And so if you're dead, you're dead. Have you ever tried to speak to a dead person in a coffin? Don't do it. They're not going to respond. Hey, you need to lose some weight. You're a little blown up. It's kind of weird, right? But they won't respond. If you cuss them out, they won't say anything. Why? Because they're dead. And so when all of a sudden people agitate you and your old nature wants to rise up, no, that nature, people come up to me all the time. He goes, Marcus, do you remember? He's like, no, nope, I don't remember. Well, they'll call me Mark. Mark, you remember when we did it? No, nope, that old man died. That old man's dead. And now the scripture says, it goes on to say that my new life now is hidden with Christ. And so when he sees you, when God sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees Christ in you. That's how he sees you. The question isn't how does he see me? How do you see me? How do you see you? Looks weird, doesn't it? I shot a picture to Joel this morning. He was laughing. He goes, that's crazy, dude. It's like, I know it's so beautiful, though, isn't it? When you see your wife, blah, 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 blah. You got to see her in Christ. When you see your church folks complaining, when you see things, that driver that's agitating, you want to flip them off or you do all that crazy nonsense. That's not your new nature. That's your old nature, man. Let that thing, now you're hidden in Christ. When the enemy tries to shame you and damn you and condemn you and put you in a, you know, in a place where, you know, just real, you just feel real bad about yourself, you got to learn your identity in Christ and say, you know what? That's the old man. Who I am and what I did are two different things. And I have to constantly renew my mind to this idea that I am no longer that old man. And it is only when, I, when the Spirit of God reminds me of those things, he empowers me to make better choices, to make good, strong choices. It's called positional uh, thinking rather than practical living. Now, here's the deal. You have positional thinking, then you have your practice. A lot of times your practice doesn't match your position. And that's the sanctifying theological terms, sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing this whole time. He's trying to get your practical application to match who you already are in him. Is this flying over some of y'all's heads? It makes sense, doesn't it? So you were crucified with him. You died with him. Now you're hidden in him. You were buried with him, the scripture goes on to say. That old nature was buried, man, in the grave. That's why when we do baptism, old things are passed away. When you come up, there's newness of life. Not only, listen, listen, listen. Hey, Bill, can you bring that? Not only were you buried with him, the scripture says that you were also raised with him. Amen. Jesus was raised from the dead. It goes on in Colossians 2.12. In him, you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And it's a beautiful picture. You were buried. You're in the tomb, that old man. Now you've been raised with Christ as well. When Jesus was raised, thank you, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think you should hold it? Yeah. Nah, no, no, you're good. You're good. It says when Jesus was raised from the dead, you were raised with him. I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. You were raised with him. So now, not only did he say you were raised with him, you were seated with him. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Positionally, and the right hand of the Father is the place of authority. So not only are you buried and crucified with him, you died with him. Now you are raised with him. And now you're up in this heavenly place in Christ. Now you're seated with him. With, because, you, because you have to understand that you have to understand this. That the head, now you, if you look at every seat in here, no one is just has a head on their seat. The head is attached to a body, as far as I know. Jesus is the head of the church. We are the body of Christ. And so when he was raised, you and I were raised as the body positionally. So we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. That's what your new identity is. 
And you and I have to understand how do we live from that place? Listen, your problems on this earth look a whole lot easier and better from this place. I know this is a horrible illustration, but I take this trip very often. I look at my circumstances and it's like, oh, it's overwhelming. Because at that level, all I see is the stuff. All I see is the hurt and the pain and all the craziness that goes on. All I see, it's 10.07 and I got to stop. It's a horrible, then all of a sudden I take an acid trip. And I go up here. Not Not an acid trip. I take a Jesus trip. That's a good way to say it. I take a Jesus trip. This is who I really am. God, I'm seated with you in heavenly places. Then I look down at my little old Mexican self. I'm like, that's stupid. Quit acting like that. Quit being like that. Quit treating her like that. Quit treating them like that. Quit thinking about that. And it becomes the perspective changes from this place. And that's where you and I, that's the struggle. That's the tension. Is you either going to stay down there and live from that place, or you're going to identify with your new identity in him and live from this place. In this place, you're an overcomer. In this place, you're strong. In this place, you're not a weak person. In this, in this place, you're not, you're not coming to a hospital every four, six, eight weeks, or every two or three weeks just to get another fix. In this place, after two years, you've been here two years or more, you should be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. If you're two years or more in the Lord here, you should be over here helping us out. Just be the, be the gospel and be the church in this city. Amen. If you're not, if you're still like, eh, Pastor, please, I need another fix. Can you sing a song over me? That's nonsense. We need to grow up. But if we're not taking the time to understand who and where our identity is now, it's never, you'll never get to that place. Amen. You are an overcomer, my friend, yes. because of what Jesus did. Amen? Amen? It's not a figure of speech. It's your spiritual reality. Your new identity is based upon true spiritual realities, not false carnal comparisons. So here's my application for you. Thank you, sir. My application is how I started it. Who's defining you? You got to answer that question. Who's defining you? What are you being defined by? And here's the last passage. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist. I love John the Baptist. But this is the testimony of John. Notice this. The Jews sent priests and Levites to him. And they were asking him, who are you? He confessed and didn't deny. He confessed, I'm not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, nope. Are you a prophet? He said, nope. Then he said, who are you? We've got to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Question, what do you say about yourself? Notice what John says. He said, I am the voice of the one, make, of the one in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet said. John finds himself in the word of God and speaks about himself what the word of God says about himself. And that's what you and I need to do. Amen? And so real quick, who are you? Let me answer that for you. Thank you for asking. Real quick, here's who you are. I'm justified. According to Romans 3. I'm alive to God. I'm dead to sin. I'm no longer living under condemnation. I'm free from the law of sin and death. I operate with wisdom because Jesus became wisdom for me. I'm alive in Christ. I'm anointed by God. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. He always leads me into triumph. I am the voice of reconciliation to God. I am blessed with all spiritual blessings. I am chosen to walk without blame and shame. I am seated with Jesus in a place of authority and grace. I am his workmanship created in 
in, in Christ to do good works here on this earth. The peace of God guards my heart and, he, and guards my mind. I can do all things through Christ. I have a full supply so all my needs are met. I have a holy calling upon my life. I am his son and strong in his grace. I live and move and have my being in him. I am made the righteousness because of Jesus. I am redeemed and forgiven according to God's riches and grace. I'm sealed by God for eternity. I'm complete. I don't have to compete. I have confidence that he hears my prayers and answers them. I no longer walk in darkness because he is light is upon me. I'm strong and have his mighty power. I have boldness and access and confidence in him. I'm forgiven. I'm his purchased possession and no longer a slave. I have a living hope. I don't have to grieve like those that grieve who have no hope. I have a living hope. I reign in this life regardless of what comes my way. He gives me the victory through Jesus Christ. I have the ministry of reconciliation. I, are y'all bored or what? I have all these things. I am an heir. I am, and I'm no longer his enemy. I'm adopted as a son by his choosing and pleasure. I'm more than a conqueror by his love. I have direct access to my father. My old nature is crucified. I live by faith. My life is now hidden in Christ. It pleases God to freely give me all things to enjoy. I abide in him. Therefore, I am fruitful. In this world, I have peace and overcome whatever comes my way. When I'm around my brothers and friends, he is in the middle of us. Whatever I ask in his name, he will do it. He chose me. He appointed me to be fruitful on this earth. He gives me rest. I have no burden that is too heavy to bear. I have authority to bind and loose. I, all things are made possible when I believe. Whenever I pray, I believe, therefore I have. I have authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I have an abundant life. I will do greater works because Jesus and the Father have approved me. I am loved by my Father and his home is within me. I stand fast in this freedom that he's given me. No longer am I entangled in bondage in this world. God is working inside of me for his good pleasure. I'm being perfected in him. I'm not alone. I'm not forsaken or afraid of any man. He is my father and what can man do to me? I resist the devil and he flees from me. I am chosen, a royal priesthood, his own special representative Mexican on this earth. I can cast my cares upon him knowing that he cares for me. I confess my failures and he forgives me. I am born of God. Therefore, I can overcome all things by faith. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's who we are. No more sugar, you know, just no more patting your backs like, Here, let's burp, little baby. Amen. Now, there's a time and a place for all that. This is a hospital in a sense. Anybody who's broken, anybody who's, you know, struggling, this is, this, we all stand on level ground here. Right. Everyone is welcome. But after a while, we need to grow up. Right. After a while, we need to identify with who we really are. And overcome and take this city for Jesus. Amen. And that's what we're about. And so that's what identity is. Next week, we'll talk about a little bit about who we are as a church. And then we'll go from there. Is that all right? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you. God, you're so good to us. And we're so thankful. We didn't deserve it. Only in your mercy and your grace. Have you been so good to us? We're no longer slaves, but now we're sons, sons of God. So we are grateful for this identity. Help us to make our practice match what we already have positionally. We trust you. We trust your spirit in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.